Um, can everybody hear me at the back? I'm not going to use a microphone unless I have to. Um, I would just like to say something about the importance uh, for history of women's studies. Um, I've certainly made my career uh, by being fairly interdisciplinary as a, as a historian, um, but it has made me a far better historian uh, to be associated with women's studies, which I think I've been associated in one form or another for 30 years, um, that it has made me think more critically, uh, more substantially, and more in terms of policy. Because although uh, I love the 19th century and I have retreated once again, again into the 19th century, I do think it, that it's important for all of us at publicly funded institutions uh, to make connections between our scholarship, wherever it may be, and whatever subject it takes up, um, and issues uh, of uh, urgent, um, that need urgent attention uh, in our own society and in the world at large. And I have been very fortunate as a Canadian historian, uh, Canada being a railway station, of course, uh, through which troop many peoples of the world, uh, raising concerns that are of issue around the world, that as a Canadianist, I think that the issues that, that we all take up as Canadianists and as feminist scholars more particularly are issues that I, I think um, are useful uh, other places as well. And I'm just en route back to Vancouver from a workshop in Hobart, Australia, uh, where we were talking about uh, adoption and fostering, obviously, most particularly uh, with regard to uh, Indigenous peoples uh, around the world and those in uh, Australia more particularly, um, and our own experience uh, with First Nations, uh, but with disadvantaged populations more generally in the history of foster care and adoption is, I think, relevant. Um, in both good ways and bad, um, and I think this is an important kind of net, the important kind of networking that academics have the responsibility to take up. I also like to say that uh, that I think my my CV re also reveals a very short attention span, um, <laughs> and what it reveals is that there are wonderful topics uh, out there that need addressing. Um, that can be taken up in a variety of ways, um, and that it's important to perhaps not spread oneself necessarily thinly, um, but to be curious, um, because curiosity uh, should be uh, what drives all research. So although I'm very committed to the policy implications of what we do, um, I think that research really does need to be curiosity driven. And fortunately, uh, we live in a world uh, where curiosity, uh, there's many occasions uh, for which curiosity is the appropriate response. I want to say a bit about uh, this book, um, because I've now actually somewhat to my embarrassment, I am now uh, being funded in Governor General Studies, which isn't a, uh, an outcome I would have predicted in my own career. Uh, and I am looking at uh, the uh, Lord and Lady Aberdeen, who are the bicycle couple in Canada in the 1890s, and I'm looking at them as uh, aristocratic reformers um, in the period before 1939, which he does. So I've taken up a very... Uh, a very separate subject, and it does reflect a kind of self-indulgent return to my past, uh, because I really love the 19th century, and addressing uh, issues around policy uh, and around children uh, have meant that I've spent a lot of time in 2009 and 2010, uh, because issues around children uh, are, are of compelling importance, and just uh, uh, fortunately, Angela, uh, a graduate student in uh, history, was able to get me the Toronto are. And it does remind me that there's really an issue of any newspaper that doesn't take up a question of child abuse. Um, and that one is moved and horrified continually by what happens to children uh, in Canada and elsewhere. Unfortunately, today is unusual, but there's still a small bit, um, a little uh, article, really a snippet, uh, just reminding us what happened to a trial I actually do talk about um, in this book. Uh, in which a five-year-old was star who starved to death in his grandparents' uh, home, um, and they were convicted of uh, second-degree murder. Um, and I thought this was uh, an educational uh, a, a ca a case um, because it reminds us that in face of uh, governments for the present day efforts to, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, make uh, the families additionally responsible, but now, of course, the extended family, so that we're talking about family kin care uh, as an ideal and as pre in, in preference to the other ways we can deal with children uh, in need of protection. And so that grandparents, particularly grandmothers, of course, uh, have been much celebrated. But we do need to remember there is a horrific story uh, often associated with family care. 
and that uh, we have to get away from romanticizing families, particularly families that don't have much support. So that this book uh, was written uh, after I'd written a book on the history of um, adoption in Canada called uh, Finding Families, Finding Ourselves, which came out with Oxford in 2006. And when I wrote that book, uh, which I thought would be the end of my book, books on children and I would turn to something else, um, I was very conscious as I wrote that book that there was a whole category of children, a much wider, um, more disadvantaged group of children um, who were turning up in care um, and in state protection from the 19th century to the present. That in many ways adoption for all the problems associated with adoption, and, and I don't want to uh, disregard those at all, but for all the problems associated with adoption, it's often a good news story. Um, and there are many, many, many more children um, who for one reason or another are not considered to be adoptable or who are not adopted who uh, are in foster care. And so that I really felt that it was important for me, uh, particularly in the context of these dreadful revelations that are coming out in British Columbia and Saskatchewan, but also Ontario, of the, the crisis. And I can tell you that the crisis in, in foster care is ongoing. Um, it's just never ending. Um, that I talk about these children in particular. And the book starts off with the phrase, more or less, this is not a happy story. Um, and I do try to talk about agency, because we do know that agency is always important, that wherever we see victimhood, we also see agency. Um, so the, today's talk uh, is in the context of this effort to deal with this large group of children and to think both critically and I hope proactively in terms of policy about uh, their situation in the past and today, and to see these real links between what happened in the past and what happens today. Um, so it starts off with claiming kinship, and I really take up this romanticization of families. I think First Nations families suffer from this uh, particularly, but so do all racialized families, uh, and middle class families are also racialized in one way or another, and that it is not helpful in seeing how children are treated. Um, and that this resort back to, you know, the family as the source of protection, families unsupported uh, by structural reform, um, is, is a problem. And so I talk about that in the first chapter, and it comes up, of course, when I'm talking about first parents. Um, that we do know um, that first parents cannot always be relied upon for, for, for reasons sometimes past uh, their own correction. Um, but certainly for a variety of reasons. I'll also take up in the second chapter this whole question of institutions. Now, when we're most preoccupied with institutions for children today, we are naturally and, and uh, quite rightly preoccupied with residential schools. Uh, the residential school uh, experience was clearly an effort uh, to assimilate and, and, to, and to, in many ways, it was an exercise in cultural genocide. I don't think there's any doubt about that at all. But institutions are a complicated picture. And if you read First Nations accounts, you can see those complications. So that if we look at institutions, while they regularly have a bad press, we always need to ask which institutions, when, and for which children. Um, and there's a more complicated story that fortunately historians, uh, I think, have, have, have helped us tell. And I've talked about this and the role of women in institutions, so that we need to talk about institutions as gendered sites as well. And so that women in institutions may well have a somewhat different role uh, than men who are groomed within a certain culture of masculinities may have, and we need to think about this. Then I have two chapters on policy in which gender, I think, is, is center stage here. And here I was very much helped by the work that's been done in Quebec, where you talk about the 1960s and the uh, getting away from church control. But what it is, in terms of many institutions, of course, is to disempower nuns who ran so many of the orphanages and institutions of social services. So there's a loss of power for women. Um, something happens in terms of the gendering of these institutions and their professionalization, which privileges lot privileges males and male professionals. And so I want to say that I think we can see this kind of uh, gender change occurring here, and it is not always in the best interest of the child. And I also try and complicate the picture by talking about what it means where First Nations really move center front in terms of our experience of child protection. Um, then uh, I look at uh, chapter five, which is what the paper today is drawn from, first families and the dilemma of care, pointing out that kids come into care because families have not been supported. And I would also argue because women have been 
encouraged to take on childbearing and childrearing, even when it's not in their best interest, um, and even when uh, supports aren't there uh, for them. Then I talk about negotiating surrogacy, which is, I think, the chapter that has the most, um, I think, is, is is, is the newest in terms of the work that's been done on, on child protection in the country, and talk about the importance of various kinds of motivation, notions of respectability in terms of foster parents, uh, but also evangelicism, um, so that you have Christian uh, foster mothers uh, becoming a very important segment of the foster care population, foster parent population, what this means. And then uh, returning, uh, ho hoping that I've given agency to both these groups, um, and then finally talk about the children themselves and what it has meant to come into the care uh, of both private agencies and the state. Um, and to suggest that there has been a variety of ways by which first parents, um, foster parents, and uh, children themselves have resisted um, their vulnerability, uh, their classification into uh, uh, various, various kinds of stigmatization. So I, I hope, uh, you probably won't see it in the talk today, that, that I've tried to balance these forces uh, in terms of understanding the adults and the children uh, who come into the child protection story is to understand them both, uh, both groups, as structurally disadvantaged often, uh, doing terrible things sometimes. I mean, we don't want to romanticize first parents or foster parents or the children themselves, who may be very, very difficult um, as individuals, as young children, and still more difficult as adults, where they often then become parents of children who are then uh, in need of state protection. Uh, so I, th I hope I've got away from the essentialism uh, that is so much a story often of child protection um, and of children generally. Okay, um, I did swear to Bettina that I wouldn't go over time, and this is reduced from 50 pages to 20, so it um, does, how, much, how many minutes do I have now since I've set it up? <laughs> Half an hour? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I've titled them First Parents, and you understand, those of you who are working well, in any areas, naming's really important. Um, much naming is prejudicial. Um, or it's essentializing. Um, so I, I name them as first parents, um, but I do know that this is a category that, can, that might well be contested. So first parents figure in most popular and professional accounts as deeply problematic to be assisted, remade, or rejected. Women frequently emerge, as uh, Quebec's Alice Parizeau lamented in the 1970s, as, I'm just going to translate, as monsters. Uh, or as a more recent uh, observer noted, objects of contempt, apparent violators of deeply held conventions about what constitutes normality, particularly for women. Aboriginal Canadians and their racialized counterparts have loomed as especially incompetent, but they have never been unique. Perspectives on uh, first parents fluctuate between pity and horror, with little inclination in general to consider systemic failure to support children or women. In many cases, parents, I would argue, have been as desperately placed as sons and daughters who enter state protection. Now, the discussion here today begins by reviewing, first of all, poverty, which I think, first and foremost, is what precipitates uh, children into care of one kind or another. It always made some parents susceptible to the loss of progeny. It then turns to women whose mater uh, maternal roles have been especially subject, uh, suspect as well as central, namely the racialized, the unwed, the battered, those with uh, perceived mental or physical disabilities, and the criminalized. It next considers biological fathers, who are the central but often offstage actors of this story, who haunt, I think, the narratives of many transfers of children in state care, but are rarely attended to on their own. Finally, it sets up Canadians' evolving response to the original parents of child candidates for care. Now looking particularly, this won't surprise most of you, the particular vulnerability of the poor. Poverty and class, it's often unacknowledged shadow, commonly propels kids into the hands of non-kin caregivers. Although abuse has always attracted much more attention, neglect or failure, commonly, commonly the inability to provide the necessities of life, has always explained the loss of most ch uh, children. Disadvantage and its consequences are regularly passed from one generation to another. And of course, the notorious cycle of poverty. 
Take, for example, a Bernardo immigrant swept out of Britain to arrive with a 10-year-old, as a 10-year-old, the younger brother who's lost sight of, in Canada in 1912. With little formal education and less adult support, she became a servant. Soon enough, unwed pregnancy forced the surrender of her only child to the local children's aid society. That daughter then moved through a series of foster homes until at age 15 she rejoins her mother. Subsequent hard work never brought uh, stability or any security, and their survival remained precarious uh, right up to the death of the daughter in the late 20th century. In another trajectory of pain after 1945, uh, Lucy Cardinal, who was a veteran of a northern mission school, who surrendered her son uh, Gill uh, when Edmonton proved too hard for a young woman without marketable skills and uncertain relations with her native family. And this is, I think, wonderfully portrayed in the uh, NFD film Foster Child from 1987. Uh, we see a similar story. Uh, once again, it's reported this cycle of poverty and admissions from 1957 to 1959 uh, to Hamilton's Children's Aid Society and its Catholic equivalent confirm these patterns. What we have is almost 43% and almost 25% of children had grandparents known to social agencies. So we get into this uh, inherited uh, pattern of disadvantage. And what I found interesting um, in doing um, foster parents their foster parents tend to move from one generation to another in the same family. And so you have multiple generations of people who are foster parents, uh, as well as multiple generations who are likely to be um, sending their kids into uh, child protection or having their kids sent into child protection. Now, a hand to mouth existence has been ultimately the best guarantee of attracting the attention of child protection agencies. As Linda Gordon concluded in her classic study of family violence in the United States, clients were disproportionately poor and racialized, not because they were the only offenders, but because they were likely to be caught. Much the same has been true in Canada. The rise of the new right in the 1980s and the 1990s with its agenda of welfare bashing and moral hypersensitivity invoked long-standing prejudice, nothing new about it, to construct mothers who were mostly poor and single and involved with child protection system as dangerous parents. And that narrative is a continuing one. Now, the loss of male breadwinners by death or desertion and ubiquitous female economic disadvantage readily catapulted Canadian youngsters onto the streets and into other households. The appearance of creches, orphanages, and settlement houses in 19th century Canada testified to links between economic vulnerability and parental failure. So too did the slow emergence, beginning with Newfoundland in uh, 1872, of state programs in aid of deserted wives. As the Great Depression of the 1930s reiterated, many families stood only a single harvest from land or sea, or one adult wage from disaster. The introduction of family allowances at the end of the Second World War had several aims, including allowing the poor to keep sons and daughters at home and in school. It also, as Dominique Marshall suggests, made mothers more responsible for school attendance and general well-being, and their failures all the more egregious. Now, as the social welfare state uncertainly expanded, poverty largely disappeared as a public issue. Um, uh, never, however, to manage, of course, in real life. As one Saskatchewan social worker remembered of the 1940s and 1950s, and I quote, municipalities don't like dirty people. They didn't like citizens who might become a charge on the community. They preferred to apprehend the children and let the parents starve, unquote. Housing was always a major issue right across the country, although particularly bad in uh, Vancouver and certainly in Toronto as well. Between 1957 and 1959, Hamilton, the nation's steel city, saw almost 22% of admissions to the Children's Aid Society and 10% of those of its Catholic counterpart occurring because of eviction. Uh, accommodation uh, difficulties uh, accounted for nearly 20% in addition to those who had been evicted. In Canada's centennial year, the director of Toronto's Children's Aid reported that, and I quote, more than 150 children of low-income families have been placed in foster homes temporarily because of the city's housing nightmare. At the end of the 20th century, Metropolitan Toronto discovered that housing drove almost 20% of children into care and delayed the return of almost another 10%. So housing is a big issue uh, in terms of the creation of this uh, substantial client group for the state. The Royal Commission on the Status of Women from 1970 and the, speci uh, the Special Senate Committee on Poverty from a year later gradually dispelled, of course, the post-war faith that bad times were largely a relic of the past. In the same decade, three Manitoba mothers with five to seven children apiece demonstrated the limits of the welfare system. Uh, only occasional prostitution 
made ends meet. Uh, and they were doing this at Christmas, so it got headlines. Uh, but it, of course, made their motherhood immediately suspect and their children likely to be apprehended. The great defeat of campaigns for a guaranteed annual income in the 1970s and 1980s, followed by decades of cost cutting in federal, provincial health and welfare programs, ensured rising levels of child poverty and child apprehension that we're dealing with today. Poor bashing, which had fallen into disfavor uh, after Canada's instructive encounter with the 1930s, emerged uh, by the 1960s and 1970s uh, to defend the rights of the better off and to slander the parenting of the disadvantaged. Where the latter might have been regarded as potential ch uh, rights bearers in the upbeat uh, decades, uh, decades uh, they became increasingly to be regarded as creators of their own misfortune in the 1980s and the 1990s and of course our own decades now. Single mothers or welfare queens as, as they became in Reaganite the United States became special targets in Canada as well. As Jean Swanson, a leading uh, Canadian anti-poverty activist, explained, poor bashing means constantly being afraid that someone will take your children. Housing, health, education, and employment conditions, of course, on First Nations reserves and among urban indigenous populations were always especially desperate. The Federal Department of Indian Affairs provided niggerly support, long preferring residential schools and arms as an arm's length solutions to distress. Provinces were no more generous uh, when they ultimately included Aboriginal families in their child protection mandates after World War II, and really not systematically uh, before the 1960s. African Canadians were similarly suspect clients to whom little was presumed owed. Uh, solutions such as the destruction of Nova Scotia's Africa Bill in the 1960s echoed remedies that targeted Native extended households as one source of parental inadequacy. There were also important differences between the way uh, the state uh, responded to Native children and others who were racialized. While Ottawa expressed its obligation to Indigenous citizens through subsidies to residential schools and occasional aid from Indian agents, the hardships facing black parents were largely ignored. After World War II, of course, slowly changing sensibilities required greater inclusion of minorities. Ironically, as with Native populations, this entailed growing apprehension. The racialization of welfare fraud control um, in both British Columbia and Ontario at the end of the 20th century and racial profiling generally gra uh, confirmed that the parenting credentials of certain racialized Canadians were all the more suspect. Immigrant status, of course, provided another source of recurring vulnerability. As early reformer James Shaver Woodsworth uh, revealed in his pioneering studies, um, impoverished arrivals, especially uh, non Northern Europeans were readily deemed culpable as parents. Franca Yocavetta uh, has documented continuing disadvantage and prejudice, of course, in her recent book, Gatekeepers, Reshaping Immigrant Lives in Cold War Canada. Uh, and at the end of the 20th century, uh, negatively, negatively racialized arrivals from many corners of the world in a familiar pattern are often isolated, lack family and community supports, are poor, are unemployed or underemployed, may not speak English or French, and are other often unfamiliar with the resources available to them. Along uh, with this, they may be completely baffled by the intervention of the child welfare system. And this, again, is a narrative that continues. From the vantage of the longer settled, the domestic cult cultures of such newcomers both explained uh, their disadvantage and made them deserving of only limited taxpayer support. While better off households might download responsibilities to camouflage illness and addiction, the poor and the racialized face uh, easier observation of their troubles. Limited resources have also sometimes driven, of course, disadvantaged parents uh, to surrender impaired and difficult youngsters in courts and, uh, to, uh, and to child protection. Tamara Myers has described how poor Montrealers attempted to use external legal authorities to discipline daughters from 1869 to 1945, while Frankie Ocavetta has pointed to later Toronto immigrants' resort to judges to curb disobedience. Early in the 21st century, hard-pressed immigrants to Quebec, uh, very recently, echoed other parents in asking for the apprehension of their out-of-control 13-year-old uh, who was taken into foster care. For such poor Canadians, the loss of offspring to the state might offer a rare opportunity for respite and treatment. And um, the last remarks just, again, want to suggest that there's always this conversation going on uh, between uh, those who are poor and those who make provision for children who seem to be vulnerable or otherwise out of control. Okay, measuring up, um, 
the, predic uh, the predicament that, uh, the predicament of mothers. Women have always made up the majority of poor adults. Uh, that unenviable status is closely related, of course, to their recurring designation as the primary caregivers. No surprise there. Both religious and secular experts have emphasized that women's highest calling lies in maternity. Uh, Ontario's first separate superintendent of child welfare, J.J. Kelso, summed up the long-standing beliefs these long-standing beliefs, in his conclusion that in 99 out of 100 cases, it is either the want of a good woman's influence or the influence of a bad woman that has brought the child within the meshes of the law. Women who rejected or failed at their primary calling were presumed to defy the natural order, not to mention gods and men. Now, assumptions about what constituted authenticity for women extended well beyond public authorities. Subject to a steady diet of maternal propaganda in matters from Mother's Day to poems such as Rudyard Kipling's A Mother of Mine from 1891, Canadians in general have concurred that maternity is women's primary responsibility. As one study of single moms observed, it was also obvious that children took it for granted that their mothers keep them and even tolerate unpleasant behavior. As one six-year-old put it, it is your natural duty to keep me. <laughs> Mothers in contact with child welfare agencies have frequently agreed. Many have justified their own fertility and retention of their offspring in face of incredible difficulties by reference to the supposedly innate qualities and rights of their sex. Even as they struggled or failed to match ideals that they themselves shared for the most part, many embraced pregnancy, childbirth, and child rearing and believed that they merited support when individual male fl males floundered. Despite a, ma a mainstream culture prizing independence, women have frequently claimed rights to assistance in matters from dealing with newborns and violent husbands to getting respite care. Such was the case in 2008, for example, with a, a mother from Victoria, British Columbia, who, was, who had five children. Uh, she had disabilities. She was living on social assistance. When told that in order to receive social assistance, which she had been receiving from the birth of the first child, that she would require supervision, and the supervision would not end uh, as long as she was on social assistance, she responded, I felt very hurt about that because I didn't think it was fair, unquote. Like others, she assumed reproduction to be natural to her sex, a right of all human beings, and meriting external support, although not scrutiny. So that there is a deep investment in many women who are forced in one way or another uh, to uh, find state support and sometimes to give up their children in the mothering role. And this, of course, is one of the reasons it's so difficult uh, to deal with in, in child welfare. Most first mothers have tried, as a result, to maintain contact even after apprehension. They still have a notion of what good mothering is. With visits to orphanages, hopes for reunion, uh, visits, of course, to residential schools and foster families, and letters and gifts. This is not unusual, and it sometimes involved great distances, as with mothers of the British home children who were sent to Canada. We also see it in the case of incarcerated women, who I'll be talking about a bit later. Their efforts in the case of incarcerated women have been called phantom mothering. Such patterns uh, also extend, of course, uh, to female migrants who are forced to leave sons and daughters behind. And this has been well documented in studies of transferred motherhood. Uh, nothing new about uh, physical distance between children uh, and their mothers, and a sense that mothers can do their mothering across great distances. So that we see foster care um, as one more example of mothering at a distance for many first mothers. They continue in their own minds to be the best mothers they can be, given what they're facing, uh, but at a distance. And we ha this phenomenon is present in many other groups in society. Of course, uh, it is present also uh, with upper class Canadians who send their kids to summer camps and to boarding schools. They also communicate at distance and affirm their good mothering in a way that is not in some ways entirely different uh, from the way that first mothers might do it when their children are in uh, foster care or in institutions. Now, in the course of their investigations, child where, child where welfare authorities have largely ignored such strength, this determination to retain and be in contact and to assert uh, one's parenting role. Delinquent mothers have been targeted always as the causal var variable of child protection. As one Canadian scholar has put it, the study of child neglect is in effect the study of mothers who fail. Even as they slowly gained rights in guardianship and custody of children, women faced toughening standards. Um, shifting response to infanticide, I think, 
con conveys the general deepening culture of blame attached to mothering in the 20th and 21st century. At the beginning of the 20th century, explanations emphasized socioeconomic disadvantage, infanticide somewhat later on was then judged a psychiatric disorder, uh, but by the beginning of the 20th first century, uh, attention spotlighted the right to life of the newborn, not the conditions usually dreadful uh, of the new mothers, but the rights of the newborn. An accompanying shift in demands that mothers enter the full-time labor force as soon as possible continued this emphasis on maternal responsibility. So women, however disadvantaged, are more and more responsibilized, an awful term used by sociologists, uh, are more and more responsibilized for the outcomes uh, of their maternity, while at the same time the world uh, encourages them to see maternity as natural. And if they want to be normal, uh, to be normal is to have children. Uh, the lot of 15 mothers recently involved with Child Protection Agency of two small Canadian cities conveys the, confer the continuing, continuing realities. All of these uh, ch uh, women had lives of little privilege and reduced expectations. They had histories themselves of family alcoholism, sexual and other mistreatment when they were children, abusive relationships with male partners, social isolation, disruption in living relationships as well as uh, problems with housing, and involvement with social services. Another contemporary assessment from today of 380 parents describes similarly high levels of disadvantage, deprivation, violence, and, and, and heavy duties. And every study you see of, 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 of foster care reveals these terrible stories of, of women's lives uh, as children are apprehended. In the 1990s, BC's Verna Bordroy, who of course is most famous for murdering her son, uh, Matthew, was far from typical in, in the murder, but her personal history was all too familiar. And, and this comes from the Royal Commission, which reported in this case. Between 1974 and the 6th of April, 1985, the day she was discharged from care at age 19, Verna was nearly always a child in care. During the first seven years, she lived in eight different foster homes, this is typical, from age 15 to 18, she lived in the ministry-supported skills development community residence in Port St. John. Finally, she lived independently while being supported financially by the ministry's independent living program. When she was returned home to her parents in 1978 for one year, she was sexually abused by her older brother. A 1981 assessment noted that Verna was developmentally delayed and emotionally insecure, and she displayed such behavioral problems as lying and stealing. She was unable to protect herself, which was quite uh, obvious in her interactions with every male in her life, and she proved ultimately, of course, no better at protecting Matthew, her son. Once again, however, in this case, and in almost every one you can follow, the neglect of women's economic and other needs cannot be separated from the subsequent neglect uh, and worse of children. And of course, in this story, uh, certain groups of women, the negatively racialized women, uh, are particularly vulnerable. Authorities and the public in general saw bad mothers always in the context of suspect communities. In the 19th century, of course, Catholic Irishness was, was sufficient condemnation, uh, and particularly uh, in areas with large uh, Irish populations. One historian described a, uh, uh, described a characterization which could have uh, been applied to a variety of other uh, racialized communities later on, and I quote, Accounts of Irish Canadian couples lying on their babies in a drunken stupor, of inebriated Irish laborers beating their children or kicking their pregnant wives in the belly, and of stabbing fights and late night brawling parties further confirmed anti Catholic prejudice. We could say later on, you know, um, anti Ukrainian, anti native, anti take your pick. Uh, even relatively mild supports, such as the story of Bridget Judge appearing in Puris Naturibus and with disheveled hair, who was found fighting with herself and pummeling a fence most lustily, or that of Anne McCabe, found lying in the gutter with her children playing about her like little pigs, reinforced the image of Irish Catholics as a drunken and degenerate blight upon the landscape of the Queen City, Toronto. Early 20th century Italians were equally credited with primitive traits that produced violence, overly fertile, and unsuitable parents. The much publicized 1911 case of 28-year-old Angelina Napolitano, who murdered an abusive husband, occasioned prejudice, even as it aroused champions of maternity. First Nations, of course, in this story have always been particularly suspect. Uh, 
As Marlene Klein has explained, such mothers, dismissed regularly as squaws, were not credited in the best interest of any child. In face of what has been termed the inferiorization of Aboriginal motherhood, church-run schools, Indian agents, and white adoptive and foster parents were hailed as improvements. Socially civilized uh, mothering uh, was believed to require elimination of extended households, itinerant wage earning, polygamy, premarital sex, matrilineal inheritance, and permissive child rearing uh, characteristics that were seen regularly uh, or believed to be seen in racialized populations. Other non-whites, of course, have also <coughs> faced uh, critical scrutiny. Until the second half of the 20th century, Chinese, Japanese, and South Asian women were stereotyped as docile and subservient, not appropriate mothers of the nation. And African-Canadian women were similarly stigmatized. Such condemnations were, of course, always challenged. And I just take the example of First Nations. The Mohawk writer and performer Pauline Johnson uh, before World War I, the carrier activist Mary John uh, after World War II, the Cree Salish activist and writer Lee Miracle uh, in the last decades of the 20th century, and groups such as BC's Indian Homemakers and the Inuit to Good uh, offered powerful alternative visions of what constituted good motherhood. But that very rarely entered the mainstream uh, child protection discourse. Miracle's relieving, revealingly titled novel, and I recommend it to you all, Daughters Are Forever from 2002, challenges mainstream prejudice in its central character, Marilyn, who drew on indigenous traditions to become a caring mother and an effective social worker dealing with child protection issues. African-Canadian women labored uh, similarly, I think, in the historic black churches and groups such as the Ontario Colored Women's Councils to reject dem demeaning depictions of their mothering. Now, such strength was, however, readily ignored by mainstream observers who rarely addressed colonialism's impact on many lives, such as the 90% of single parent clients in one urban native child and family service agency who were former foster children and who were often, again, the granddaughters of residential school students. Okay, now looking at unwed and solo, solo mothers, um, another group who are particularly suspect uh, as original as first mothers. In the 19th and early 20th century, the unwed tended to be regarded as largely innocent victims of male lust if they were chaste, or if they were regarded as promiscuous as probably mentally deficient and probably foreign. Redemption could, for this group, uh, for a particular former group, come through marriage or through sacrifice on the altar of maternal duties. Uh, continued responsibility for illegitimate offspring constituted both punishment and instruction uh, for many years, and certainly in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Such mothers were never, however, ever to entirely escape the taint of immorality. By the 1920s and to, and to the years after World War II, things started to change in terms of reception. Experts who were influenced by the psychological theories of the day shifted their assessment of unwed motherhood. Unwed white mothers were now deemed not so much immoral as maladjusted, increasingly conceptualized with little explicit reference to class, and as essentially or potentially respectable, such racially privileged women might recover uh, their respectability uh, by immediately transferring their offspring to married couples. In a memory sap sapping exercise of compartmentalization that recalls, I think, experiments with twilight sleep in childbirth in the same period, they might forget. In essence, such young women were regarded as too immature to know their own best interest, and those who were truly adults, notably social workers, but also religious and medical authorities and older relatives, should make the right decision. While comparisons are difficult, young white mothers uh, have sometimes found it e much easier, I think, um, than others in contact with child welfare to contemplate reunions with adopted and fostered offspring. And if you follow the searching story, which I think is a very important one in lots of ways, you see that the, the mothers who kids want to find and the mothers who search are really disproportionately unwed white mothers, uh, largely from lower middle class or middle class backgrounds from the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, like a print and radio journalist Anne Petrie, sent away to give birth in the 1960s, she'd been an undergraduate at UBC, they prompted sympathy as youthful victims of, of times, circumstances, or unworthy men. They appeared, such single mothers, as better candidates for redemption than mothers, uh, single or otherwise, who were accused of neglect or abuse. So that we really do need to break up our population uh, of uh, first mothers. 
Unwed teens and 20s of European heritage have loomed largest, uh, again, in uh, searching documents. As codes of mor mor morality shifted in the 1960s and 70s, surrenders of uh, babies by this group, however, became much less common, prompting a crisis, uh, particularly in adoption, uh, which helped turn uh, Canadian adopters to international adoption, which I've talked about elsewhere. Now, women racialized as inferior, whether as Aboriginal, African, or Asian in origin, were much less likely to be encompassed within this modern narrative. For them, older stories of immorality remain strong throughout the 20th and 21st century. They, are far more, they have been far more likely to be encouraged to keep their offspring because a few of the few adopters uh, have wanted them. Uh, their children, in other words, are little in demand. Laura Chambers' study of Ontario's unmarried mothers from 1921 to 1969 also suggests that non-Anglo-Saxon, although white, immigrants evoked less professional concern, had fewer supports, and were more likely to surrender babies. Stigmatized mothers, however, uh, those who knew the racial score of their day, had, I think, good reason to attempt to keep children who otherwise might drift in and out of institutions and foster homes, so that the children of white mothers, particularly white uh, middle-class mothers uh, could hope uh, that their children would be placed very well, uh, children of racialized mothers, uh, the outcome was likely to uh, be um, much less successful, at least in the first instance. By the end of the 20th century, unwed met women of all backgrounds, however, who lacked resources, faced growing condemnation. And I think this is a kind of generalization um, of this older, uh, return to this older code of morality. Uh, but it was not a sexual morality, it was a morality uh, to do with finance, and particularly financial capacity. Uh, single mothers uh, who needed state support of any kind were attacked increasingly uh, in the 1980s and beyond as attacked as burdens on the state finances, a symptom of a crisis in heterosexuality, a sign of promiscuity, especially on the part of racial and ethnic minorities, and a reflection of an unwelcome female, even feminist independence. In 2001, Canadian media dealt in all these tropes in censoring two BC single mothers. And you may have followed the headlines for quite a long time, certainly in the BC press. Uh, one who was a blonde 20-something-year-old, very beautiful, involved with black American basketball player. Um, so there were all sorts of questions about who was going to support the resulting child. And the other case, a much married 30-something Palestinian immigrant um, who uh, had, who was involved uh, with her child being either tossed or falling <coughs> off a bridge uh, in uh, North Vancouver. Whatever their origin, such unwed mothers always confronted, of course, a terrible contradiction, uh, whatever their class or racial background. Most desperately needed paid employment, but if they weren't in uh, the home, they were by definition regarded as bad mothers for much of this period. Few women ever entirely chose single parenthood. We are preoccupied often now with choices that professional women make around single parent, largely professional women make around single parenthood, but very few have, in fact, this is a, a minority, a tiny minority phenomenon. Uh, the, the reality, I think, is better reported by one Canadian teen uh, who, despite her own supportive parents, which was not always the case, far from it, spoke for many before and after, uh, she's in the 1960s, in concluding, I have to give up my child, not because I really want to, but because I know it would be better for him. I was only 15, with a grade 10 education, no husband, and no means of support. I wish I could have kept him, unquote. And in the context of commonplace reception of single parenthood, her choice made perfect sense. Okay, turning to another group, battered and bruised. Uh, Canada's major study of so-called bad mothers confirms the association of male violence with child apprehension. Angelina Napolitano in Sault Ste. Marie just before World War I was unusual in murdering her tormentor, but her beatings were familiar and they, they run through all the study of child protection. In 1897, Ontario legislation recognized the pervasiveness of such beatings by allowing women to petition, petition uh, criminal courts for maintenance order on the grounds of marital cruelty and extended the definition of a deserted wife to include oh, um, 
So that battering then um, and violence of one kind or another is reported uh, from the 19th century to the present. Uh, nevertheless, we have governments making very little provision uh, for refuges, for battered women's support services, and of course since the 1980s, withdrawing quite uh, dramatically uh, from its provision that had been very much the thrust of the second women's movement. Uh, we also see uh, that father-daughter incest and a variety of, of uh, other forms of domestic violence have offered opportunities to accuse mothers of being um, of shirking their obligations, and so that women have been blamed for not protecting their children, even when often is the case they are the first victims of the violence that is also includes child abuse and 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 incest as well. The fact that uh, that mothers sometimes are the uh, greatest percentage of people who killed infants are, are often mothers. Uh, this is the only place where uh, women over, uh, uh, outnumber men in terms of homicides. Uh, that This can be explained by the fact that they spend much more time with infants, uh, that most of the mothers are themselves abused, and that they have fewer options of, of escape than do fathers. Uh, then I turn to uh, parents with disabilities, and particularly women with disabilities. And of course, the hierarchy of worthiness as a parent is impossible to define precisely, but Canadians with physical and mental impairments have certainly uh, stood very far from parental ideals. In this brutal calculation, women are additionally liable, of course, because of their greater uh, likelihood of poverty, and therefore an inability to treat uh, the symptoms of disease and illness and, and disability, uh, which inevitably turn up <coughs> in all our lives. And so that women with disability have been seen in the first instance as not suitable to get pregnant, and should they get pregnant, uh, as, as likely to produce genetically defective offspring, and we see this in the eugenics legislation, um, and that disability in general has always been gendered, both in its expression and in the ways that it has been addressed. And so that women with disabilities uh, disproportionately contribute to uh, child protection uh, agendas. And of course the issues around supporting them in a variety of ways uh, remain uh, constant with us. They, they came up in 1997 when the Supreme Court of Canada had to rule whether pregnant women, for example, could be forced into treatment. Um, and uh, the question of what, what is the nature of the intervention uh, I think has been uh, really central uh, both for pregnant women and for women with disabilities attempting to raise children. And as they now increasingly access modern technological and other supports, which may be entitled as citizens, some women with a variety of impairments are also, of course, more able to embrace maternity, and we're seeing this uh, as an issue today in child protection, too. That possi possibility further unsettles, unsettles today's child protection agendas, raising questions once more of rights to caregiving and caretaking. Okay. The criminalized population. Now, some first mothers have been involved in criminal activity. While far fewer than male prisoners, most imprisoned women have been poorer, less educated, and more addicted. They have also been far more likely uh, to, to lose children in foster care, even before they were sentenced. When incarcerated, uh, they have also been more likely uh, to uh, be further away from their children, because Canadian uh, women's prisons are fewer in number, uh, so the children may be uh, at great distance. At the beginning of the 21st century, two-thirds of incarcerated women are mothers, and two-thirds of these are single parents, uh, because it's much more common for a husband to leave his wife or a partner to leave uh, his uh, partner than uh, the reverse. Women are likely to remain with men even when they're imprisoned. Uh, most women uh, have substantial medical problems who are uh, incarcerated. Um, Certain populations, again, remain additionally vulnerable. In 2009, the Correctional Service of Canada reckoned that the Aboriginal woman is generally 27 years old with a grade 9 education and single with two or three children. She has limited education and employment skills, and she's usually unemployed at the time of her crime. Many, of course, have also been sexually abused. The portrait of black offenders is similar. In 2000, they constituted 9% of federally incarcerated women far out of proportion uh, to the share of the population, and most of them were mothers. Despite the presence of large numbers of mothers in Canadian prisons, we have made very little provision. 
The occasional initiative, such as the Mother Baby Program at BC's Alouette Correctional Center, was cancelled in 2008, despite the opposition of provincial social workers, because it seemed to complicate the incarcerated regimes. Um, shortfalls continue because it's easier to, to commonly question the criminalized woman's capacities of her rights to raise children, and, uh, and to, of course, shape the citizens of tomorrow. Um, now, I'm out of time, so um, I think. Um, so I'm not going to talk about fathers, but I want to remind you that fathers are central to this narrative. Uh, but they're always, they always seem to be problematic. They get treated differently. They are responsibilized differently. Their responsibility really begins and ends, for most of them, with financial support. Um, and for most uh, children in care, financial support has not been forthcoming uh, from these fathers. The fathers also have been demonized. We know very little of them. If, if first mothers have been understudied, certainly first fathers have been less understudied, less studied. The other problem for first with first fathers is that social workers have often been frightened of them. Uh, because they are seen, and they are, sources of violence in the family, and fathers are more likely than mothers to regard this intervention uh, as something uh, that they should respond to in a violent way. So the efforts to make fathers more responsible, to include fathers uh, as part of the solution, uh, meets this uh, problem that, that we have not addressed well, of how to deal with men who, for a variety of reasons, uh, have learned violent responses uh, to these kinds of situations. I wanted to also point out that the situation for um, Aboriginal men is somewhat different because men and women in these communities often understand or see the violence as reflecting the experience of colonization. So they have a sympathy and they hope that they can find ways to retrieve the men for the good of the, the community. This has proved very difficult so that if you look at um, indigenous communities, they are certainly fighting a battle that looks pretty familiar uh, in terms of uh, issues around sentencing and community control. Um, so then what I want to say is that the judgments on first parents really reflect uh, very much the fact of their original vulnerabilities. Uh, first parents overwhelmingly come from variously stigmatized and marginalized populations. Um, that within these families there are likely to be generations of uh, loss of children or children who come encounter, in, who encounter state, state protection and state discipline regimes in a whole variety of ways. Uh, the community um, has found, uh, has responded in the first instance, I think that if we look at uh, uh, communities in the 19th century, we see informal mechanisms to control parents who believe to be bad parents, uh, reporting to the state, uh, but also uh, community uh, public criticisms of, of bad parents. Um, and as Canadians grew more familiar with child rearing standards endorsed by uh, modern experts and revelations of child uh, mistreatment, Canadians have been very active, and you look at the amount of child uh, reporting of child abuse across the country is very high. Uh, it's also true that that the reports of child abuse, uh, that much of it is seen to be uh, unsupported. So we have many Canadians who are very uh, very sensitive to child abuse, um, and we also see that they're more likely to report the poor. Again, that you are protected from child charges of child abuse, not only because you can buy out of complications with children, but because you have a private home as a middle class or upper middle class person. Uh, so that assessments, uh, wherever they are, do target particular populations. But they also remind parents that external sanctions are best avoided. Um, Now, first parents who are in contact with child protection always recognize doubts about their character and capacity. Many reject scrutiny and evaluation, and certainly the fathers are particularly obvious in this. Uh, while some birth parents do accept condemnation, few, however, have left lengthy explanations. A very rare exception that should be drawn to our attention is a book-length account from Elizabeth Camden, who was born in 1948, in a book called If He Comes Back, He's Mine, from 1984, uh, her, her nine-year-old son became a crown reward. Uh, 
Assisted by a sympathetic social worker, she told her own story, quite movingly, of neglect and abuse. Like others before and after, she sought unconditional love in a baby, but violence soon followed. Eventually, she herself, however, untypically, called the Children's Aid Society and the police to intervene. She felt she was toppling down in ways she could not recover. She accepted, as she said, the disgust and the contempt of the foster mother. And this is one of the factors that really complicates relationships between foster parents and first mothers, is that foster parents regularly condemn, and, uh, and their class position may not be entirely dissimilar um, from that of first parents. And she shared the contempt that she saw in the foster parents' <coughs> eyes. She said, I didn't blame her for it. I felt the same way about myself. And she hoped that someday her son would understand why things happened the way they did, and he'd know how much I loved him and what strength it took for me to give him up. Her actions, however, were highly unusual, uh, but her shame and the regret um, that I think characterizes most first pa parents' response to the loss of children um, is not. The end of the century, 20th century also saw a few, few birth parents organize against accusations of abuse um, and to defend, attempt to defend their own parenting. In the 1990s, at least one Canadian attempted to establish local chapters of the U.S.-based victims of child abuse laws. Others complained to the courts and to the media. And in 2008, parental uh, protests, of course, uh, helped discredit an Ontario pathologist who helped convict uh, parents of child battery or baby battery. Now, when foster care proved a nightmare, some parents also pursued um, uh, su uh, support in the courts. One resilient and resourceful and loving, I would argue, BC mother who had surrendered her two sons so that they could escape abuse from their father was the only way she could get out of this violent situation and safeguard her kids. She demanded punishment when she learned that her two sons had been sexually and physically abused by two sets of foster parents after she gave them up for their own protection. Such efforts, however, remain highly unusual, running up against the disgrace of any contact whatsoever with child protection authorities. And I see, see in first parents this culture of disgrace, which makes it very difficult often for them to articulate um, their own predicament and for others to appreciate what brought them uh, to the point where their children were apprehended. Now, ultimately, of course, regularly impoverished birth parents have always had limited resources to counter charges, and people don't want to listen to them because they see their defense as, of course, self-interested, and they usually or often is. Only a small minority have ever been reckoned worthy of significant sympathy. Um, other than being defined as a, a pedophile, uh, to have your child uh, um, taken in for, by reason of neglect or cruelty or abuse is one of the ways that you lose credibility in almost all uh, communities. First parents, especially mothers, have been blamed and shamed, but the conditions, however, that commonly give rise to their difficulties and inadequacy remain largely unaddressed from the 19th century to the present. So frequently made risky parents is by conditions uh, such as housing that have been in part at least largely beyond their control. They continue to lose offspring and the numbers in care are rising in every province uh, and to reap pity or revulsion rather than understanding in the early 21st century. That's it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sure <laughs> you should have tied me to my desk so I cut off another five pages. <laughs> we asked you here because we wanted to hear you talk so thank you <laughs> and I didn't want you to talk too long so there'll be a chance for some questions and answers and there